While exploring the ruins of Cambridge, we come upon a pre-war police station. It's under attack by a swarm of feral ghouls. If we're feeling generous, we can step in and help. We appreciate the assistance, civilian. But what's your business here? Pest exterminator. I heard you had a feral problem. If I appear suspicious, it's because our mission here has been difficult. Since the moment we arrived in the Commonwealth, we've been constantly under fire. If you want to continue pitching in, we could use an extra gun on our side. We're on recon duty, but I'm down a man and our supplies are running low. I've been trying to send a distress call to my superiors, but the signal's too weak to reach them. Sir. If I may... Proceed, Halen. I've modified the radio tower on the roof of the police station, but I'm afraid it just isn't enough. What we need is something that will boost the signal. Our target is ArcJet Systems, and it contains the technology we need, the deep-range transmitter. We infiltrate the facility, secure the transmitter, and bring it back here. No time to waste. Let's get moving. Outstanding. Paladin Dance brings us inside. We can loot some ammunition and stim packs on the counter before heading out. Follow me, and try not to lag behind. Incidentally, that's probably one of the best animations I've seen in the game. Why did they only use it here? Paladin Dance leads us outside and we begin a short trek along the road to the Arcjet systems. Along the way, we run into a number of enemies, including a gaggle of raiders. Now inside the police station, we find a terminal and a holotape that fills us in a little bit as to why Paladin Dance is here and the struggles that he has seen. Dance, Halen, Rees were part of the Gladius Brotherhood of Steel recon squad. They were sent here by the Brotherhood of Steel on the Capital Wasteland to search for pre-war technology. Paladin Dance and his squad set up there at the Cambridge Police Station because it was fairly well fortified. From there, they tried to attack the Corvaga assembly plant looking for pre-war tech, only to be repelled by the raiders there. During that attack, they lost two of their men, Knight Brack and Knight Warwick. Dance then took his men towards the Boston airport and tried to attack Fort Strong, but there they were repelled by the super mutants, and it was there that Knight Sergeant Dawes was killed. Dance has lost over half of his squad since arriving at the Commonwealth, and he desperately needs to get in contact with Scabbard. Scabbard is a man who works on the Pridwin. We hear his voice on the radio when trying to infiltrate the Pridwin with the railroad at the end of the game. Deacon and Tinker Tom have a humorous conversation with him, but it's clear that Dance wants to get a hold of him so that through Scabbard he can get new orders from Maxon on the Pridwin. But their comm system is down, and so we're heading to Arcjet Systems where Scribe Halen tells us we'll find a deep range transmitter. This will allow Dance and his recon squad to contact the Brotherhood of Steel on the Pridwin in the Capital Wasteland or at least on the way from the Capital Wasteland. It's also here where we find a personal holotape from Scribe Halen, where she expresses a little bit of regret for joining the Brotherhood of Steel. She admires their mission to secure pre-war technology to prevent humanity from making the same mistakes they made that led to the nuclear apocalypse, but she's not fond of the Brotherhood's methods. In her mind, the Brotherhood lacks diplomacy. Their only method of negotiation, of getting what they want, is using their fists. Field Scribe Halen, personal log entry, 324A. I'm starting to wonder if joining the Brotherhood of Steel was a good choice. I originally signed up seeking protection and comradeship, but I'm worried that I've traded away a bit of my humanity in the process. The Brotherhood's message of hope for the future is idealistic and noble, but their methods leave a lot to be desired. The leadership seems especially misguided. Instead of diplomacy, they wield violent confrontation to exert control. Despite all that, I've been successfully avoiding the fighting by following the career path of a field scribe. I suppose only time will tell how long I can stand the sight of spilled blood over my own moral fiber. At last, we arrive at the door to Arcjet Systems. Listen up. We do this clean and quiet. No heroics and by the book. Understood? Inside, Nance expresses some thoughts he has about the pre-war world. It was corporations like this that put the last nail in the coffin for mankind. They exploited technology for their own gains, pocketing the cash and ignoring the damage they'd done. 
As we continue down, we pass by a number of terminals that have interesting lore on them. We'll get to those in a minute, until we reach a room with a whole bunch of destroyed Protectrons. Look at these wrecks. It appears as though the facility's automated security's already been dealt with. Is this the Brotherhood of Steel's handiwork? Unfortunately, no. Look at the evidence. There isn't a single spent ammunition casing or drop of blood in sight. These robots were assaulted by Institute Synths. Synth? Isn't that the same as robot? They're an abuse of technology created by the Institute. Abominations meant to improve upon humanity. It's unacceptable. They simply can't be allowed to exist. What's the Institute? They're a group of scientists who went underground when the Great War started. Spent the last few decades littering the Commonwealth with their technological nightmares. Sounds like you're scared of sense. There's a measurable difference between being frightened and being prepared. Now, let's move out. Looks like the Institute has already beaten us to Arcjet Systems. Continuing forward, we reach a large room, but the door is locked. Looks like a dead end. See if you can find a way to get that door open. I'm gonna reconnoiter the area. Inside the lab analyst's terminal, we get even more lore and the password for the nearby lab control terminal. On the table near to this terminal is a holotape. Why the heck are they making us record this? Oh crap, it's on, isn't it? <laughs> um, this is Technician Rand, Arc Jet Propulsion Division. I'm here with Technician Janowski, work log A1190. Janowski and I have been working on the Mars Shot Project for about three months now, and I think we have the thrust calculations worked out. Man, I wish I was headed up there with those guys. It'd be nice to get the hell away from our lousy planet. Hey, easy. If we don't record these logs properly, we're going to get fired. The supervisor is already itching to get rid of us, especially since it's taking us longer than we promised. So what? We've been drafted anyway. We're shipping out in a few weeks, remember? <sighs> Soon we'll be doing push-ups, eating freeze-dried rations, and just wishing we were spending our day inside a cushy private laboratory. Of course I remember. But I'm trying not to imagine getting my head blown off when I'm on the front line, and keeping my mind on work is helping me deal with the problem. Maybe that doesn't make sense to you, but it's important to me, okay? All right. I'm sorry. Look, why don't you toss this tape We'll start a new one. Sounds like before the bombs dropped, the U.S. military had started a nationwide draft conscripting people into the military. This was going to take some of the best talent away from private corporations like ArcJet Systems, reducing the nation's productivity. Inside the terminal, we see that the lab controls are locked. We don't have access to the prototype from here, but from here, we can unlock the door. And as soon as we do, synths! Hostile sensor reading detected. <laughs> Call the caged. Dance bolts forward through a hole in the wall. He skips by a ton of loot and working terminals filled with all sorts of lore. His mind is focused on only one thing, but we have plenty of time to stop by the CEO's terminal and pick up a copy of Tesla Science Magazine. Will robots rule the world? Energy weapons permanently inflict 5% critical damage. In the next room, Dance attracts the attention of ceiling mounted turrets. We could have deactivated these from a terminal in a nearby room had we actually stopped to smell the roses, but no, Dance just barreled straight ahead. After they are dealt with, Dance goes down a broken ramp and down some stairways to reach a door to the Arcjet engine core. Engine core's ahead. Should be our final stop. This zones us into another interior cell. I'm gonna let Pallet and Dance wait for me on the other side of this door while I talk about the story of the Arcjet Systems Company and Laboratory. I'm gonna go back and loot the corpses, desks, filing cabinets, and boxes, and read all of the terminals that we missed to put together this story. The story begins with the CEO of Arcjet Systems named Thomas Reinhardt. Thomas Reinhardt negotiated with the United States Space Administration to be the company responsible for building a rocket that would take humanity to Mars. This was called the Mars Shot Project. Arcjet Systems, then, is a private company working for the United States Space Administration to create the XMB booster rocket. 
Thomas's company was in the hole before they got this contract, but now that they're working on the XMB booster, things are finally looking up. Thomas is extremely happy because he managed to snipe some exceptional talent. He managed to lure a man named Dr. Rory McClellan away from his United States military contracting position. He says that Dr. McClellan's aptitude with nuclear propulsion systems is completely unmatched. So in his words, he says this was truly a coup. But it was extremely expensive. It cost the company a whole lot of money to hire Dr. Rory McClellan. Now that they have this amazing scientist on staff, Reinhardt feels comfortable telling the Space Administration that they will have the XMB booster rocket an entire year before the 2078 launch date. He thinks they're going to have the rocket done with time to spare. From Rory McClellan's side of things, he's pleased to be working in the private sector again. He says that working for the military is a horrible, never-ending grind of broken promises, slashed budgets, and ridiculous deadlines that he has learned to hate. He's thrilled to be, as he says, broadening his horizons and doing something he's always dreamed of doing, helping send astronauts to Mars. Now, the company was also hired by the space agency to develop a deep-range transmitter. This is what we are actually in ArcJet Systems to find. The point of this transmitter was to allow the astronauts on the rocket headed to Mars to be able to communicate with the USSA back on Earth in record time. Their goal with creating this deep range transmitter is to increase the radius that the transmitter can function and reduce the time it takes for radio transmissions to work between the rocket destined for Mars and Earth. Now we learned from the lab terminal that another scientist was tasked with coming up with the best propulsion system for the XMB rocket. All of the original plans by Dr. McClellan were to use uranium as the primary fuel for this rocket. But this unnamed scientist believes that switching from uranium to deuterium will yield a much higher burn to thrust ratio. The problem is that refining the deuterium is going to take a couple of months, which will inevitably delay the completion of the XMB booster. But this scientist says that it's worth it. Reinhardt already has all of the scientists on his team working seven days a week as it is. But this scientist doesn't even mind putting in extra time if he can improve the booster's efficiency. His sole motivation is making the astronauts on the rocket safer. So he rigged up an experiment, and the results were that deuterium is indeed much more efficient than uranium. So he showed the demonstration to Dr. McClellan, and Dr. McClellan was very impressed. Dr. McClellan then took this scientist's notes to the board and to Reinhardt in person, but Reinhardt said no. At the end of the day, it all came down to money. The delay of a few months would have added millions of dollars to this project, and Reinhardt simply was not willing to front the cost, which is strange to me because a couple of million dollars in the Fallout world, when you take into consideration the crazy inflation in that universe, is not a whole lot of money. I'm not going to sit here and do the math, but a couple million dollars in the Fallout world is like a couple hundred thousand dollars an hour. This scientist is extremely frustrated because he says that using deuterium instead of uranium is going to be extremely efficient and it's going to be much more safe. He thinks that a couple hundred thousand dollars and a few months is a small price to pay for making sure that the mission succeeds. He's so disillusioned by by what happened here that he says after this project wraps up he's gonna look for work somewhere else but the reason we're talking about him to begin with is because he's responsible for the success of the deep range transmitter after he failed to convince the higher-ups to use deuterium instead of uranium they actually moved him off of the XMB booster project and put him onto the deep range transmitter project this scientist says that he thinks they moved him simply because they were sick of him constantly complaining when things go wrong so instead of doing what he has a degree in what he was trained to do, nuclear physics, he's now fine-tuning, as he says, a glorified radio. He's tasked with increasing the broadcast range of the deep-range transmitter by at least 50% by the end of the month. He says it's going to be a piece of cake, and we later learn that it only took him three weeks to increase the range of the deep-range transmitter by 70%. And he reduced the size of the unit by half, so that it fits inside the XMB rocket. So despite all the money Reinhardt paid to get Dr. McClellan on staff, he kind of already had a nuclear physicist genius working on staff, which makes me wonder if McClellan was even worth all the money Reinhardt spent. The fact that the project runs into a 
huge problem under the leadership of McClellan makes me also wonder about whether or not McClellan was really the most qualified individual. In March of 2076, the entire project was delayed because the rocket was overweight. This was due to the fact that they were using a uranium refinement subsystem, which put the entire rocket a few hundred tons overweight. That put them another month behind schedule, and CEO Reinhardt is starting to panic. From McClellan's perspective, the problem is with the USSA's guidelines. The rocket is just too heavy for their guidelines. It can still get astronauts into space, it can still deliver the payload, but the government guidelines say it has to be lighter. The most startling thing from McClellan's perspective is how angry Reinhardt got. He says, after I told him the bad news, I've never seen him so angry. Reinhardt's reaction reminded him of some of the army generals that McClellan had worked with in the past. He tried to reassure Reinhardt as best as he could, but McClellan walked away from that conversation thinking that if he delivers the rocket any later than what he's predicting, he might have to find another job. To make matters worse, in July that same year, the USSA started a huge public relations campaign promoting the Mars Shot Project in an effort to instill patriotism amongst the American people. Because of this big marketing campaign, ArcJet Systems found itself right in the middle of a huge national spotlight. Since the public relations announcement, Reinhardt has had over 15 separate interviews with everyone, magazines, newspapers, televisions, asking the same questions over and over again. When will the XMB booster be ready to test fire so they can take pictures for their newspapers? Nobody knows that there's this huge uranium refinement problem that keeps putting the XMB booster back and back and back, but the CEO has faith he just smiles and lies through his teeth saying, well, we'll deliver the XMB booster when it's ready and on schedule. The entire time he's losing faith that Dr. McClellan is going to solve the weight problem. If he doesn't, that's the end of ArcJet Systems. They'll never get a contract from the USSA again. Now that ArcJet Systems is under national scrutiny, CEO Reinhardt is starting to freak out. On the repair department terminal, we see that Reinhardt went to the department to get a brand new terminal for his office. He wanted something a little bit more secure. On the security terminal, we learned that he sent an email out to the security team saying that he wanted the security department to get together and implement a new security strategy for the entire ArcJet complex. He says that there is no room for slip-ups when working with the USSA. If they make one mistake, they will never get a contract this big again. Of particular note, he says, you guys need to hire a consultant to figure out a better security password system for our terminals. Apparently, these terminals were automatically re resetting passwords and then emailing those passwords every month or so. Which of course is crazy to have a password for such a secure facility emailed to you or intramailed to you. This is incidentally how we gain access to that lab door. The only way we got through is because we happened to open up one of those intramails that had the automatically generated password on it. Reinhardt was right. It's a horrible security feature. In order to strengthen security, Reinhardt distributed identification badges to all employees employees, but these identification badges were infused with a low-yield radioactive isotope that only their internal systems could identify. He says, look, you need to go get your badges, otherwise you could get shot for walking around without your badge, and if you do, we're not responsible for any damage you might receive. The repair guys in the repair department think that Reinhardt is paranoid. They had them install a bunch of ceiling-mounted turrets outside his office, in the hallway. These are the turrets that dance triggered by barreling through the hallway. The repairman says, You'd think we were working for the military instead of just the United States Space Administration. Which is an interesting comment. Could there be more to the Mars shot project than initially meets the eye? We already know from Fallout New Vegas lore that the military would often work with private companies to get satellites orbiting the Earth. We learned that in my video on the Helios 1 complex in the Mojave Wasteland and the Archimedes 2 laser. Could it be that the XMB booster's payload was more than just a couple of astronauts on their way to Mars? 
The national scrutiny is getting so intense that Reinhardt has to send an email to the receptionists in the reception's desk on the lobby floor. Reporters keep coming into the lobby and trying to interview these poor receptionists, and Reinhardt says, look, if they come asking for an interview, just tell them that you're a receptionist. You don't actually have any of the information. Do not, under any circumstances, make any claims about what we're working on here or the company unless you get pre-authorized. He then gave each of the receptionists a private safe with its own lock so that they can pay for any deliveries right then and there to reduce congestion in the lobby. That's how thick it was down there. Thankfully, in November of 2076, the entire issue was solved. On the CEO's terminal, we read that Dr. McClellan's team finally delivered. They solved the XMB booster's weight problem, and now all they gotta do is tighten a few screws, hoist the thing up into the engine core, and then test fire. But back in McClellan's terminal, we learn that McClellan stole the idea to use deuterium instead of uranium from one of his lab scientists. He says, thanks to some suggestions from my research team and some of my own sleepless nights, I've been able to reduce the XMB booster's final shipping weight, which means that he lied to that lab scientist. McClellan tried to tell the scientist that McClellan thought it was a great idea, that it was all Reinhardt's fault. Reinhardt said no. Reinhardt was worried about the months it would add to the schedule, but in reality, he just wanted to save face. He wanted to make Reinhardt think that he came up with the idea so that he could save his own job. That's why he moved the scientist to the Deep Range Transmitter Project. He couldn't risk having the true source of this breakthrough so close to home. So instead of being the guy who's so against the government and the military, can't wait to work for the private sector, just wants to send a guy to Mars. At the end of the day, McClellan is willing to do anything, even ruin a man's career, to save his own skin. But at least the problem is solved. Reinhardt goes ahead and schedules a photo shoot with one of the local newspapers to take place during the XMB booster's first test firing inside the engine core room. That's the room that Paladin Dance has entered, and we're waiting to enter that room soon. He says, we're gonna stick them all down into that control room and let them shoot their pictures through the thermoglass windows after Dr. McClellan gives them a short explanation of how the booster works. The engine puts out a whole lot of thrust, so it's sure to be a spectacular show. But for some reason, Reinhardt canceled the press event. This confuses McClellan. He says, I don't get what happened. Reinhardt canceled the press event only hours before it was supposed to begin. As far as he's concerned, he's confident that the XMB booster is working right. It's ready to start the test fire. So he went and talked with Sam Brent, who's in charge of security for the Arc Jet facility, who told him that there may have been a possible security breach somewhere and that he had recommended that the entire event be postponed until a later date. McClellan walks away thinking that Brent might not be telling him the truth. Come to find out, he's not. The last message we find on Sam Brent's security terminal is directly from Reinhardt himself. And we learn that a member of the press managed to get into the facility before the event was supposed to happen, and he got all the way down to the engine core room. Nobody noticed that he was there, and so McClellan was going about his work. He was fiddling with the systems, optimizing the way the engine would fire, and so he did a minor test fire. The test fire completely vaporized the journalist who had found his way into the engine core room. Reinhardt is furious. He sends a message to Brent, head of security, saying, how did this journalist go through the entire research facility and get to the engine core without tripping any of our alarms and turrets? This is a huge mess on our hands. And you know what? You're gonna be cleaning it up. I don't care how you do it, just make it all go away. If this comes back to bite us, I swear, you're gonna be the one that takes the fall. Here we get a small taste of the kind of anger that Reinhardt is capable of. And so, Brent goes down to the repair office, the guys who set up those ceiling-mounted turrets, outside Reinhardt's office, and confiscated all of the video surveillance records from the mainframe from the previous month. The repair guys tried to give Brent the backups, but Brent insisted on the originals. The repair guys had no idea what was going on, but they did as they were asked. And he says, I don't want to know what's going on. As long as I keep getting a paycheck, I could care less. Many months later, in October 2077, McClellan just so happened to be going through some video recordings of some XMB booster rocket test firing that he had done in the past. And he came across the carbon burn-off pretest he did back in February. But in one of the angles of the video footage, he swears he saw someone running across the bottom of the engine core. 
right before the booster ignited. He has video proof that they accidentally incinerated somebody during a testing. He took the video footage straight to Reinhardt and threw it on his desk, and Reinhardt finally confessed. He admitted that he told Brent to cover the accident up, but then he told McClellan, he says, look, if you go to the police, I'm gonna come for you, and I'm gonna come for your family. McClellan doesn't know what to do. His final note is in October 2077, likely just a few days, if not the day, before the bombs dropped. He says, I've got no choice but to bring this tape directly to the press tomorrow and hope the authorities can stop Thomas before he does anything stupid. The last window we get into the operations of the Arcjet company before the bombs dropped comes from CEO Thomas Reinhardt. It's September 2077, a month before the bombs dropped. He says all of the unrest overseas is making the USSA nervous about proceeding with the Mars shot project. After all the work they did, the USSA is thinking about pulling out. Depending on what happens between China and the US government, they may have to delay. And if that's true, the company's gonna have to survive only on the money they got from the deep range transmitter contract, which they've already completed. Thanks to the work of the unnamed lab assistant, they didn't get any credit for actually solving the XMB booster weight problem. Reinhardt says, I'm trying to keep everyone's spirits up around here, but it's getting harder and harder with the world falling apart around us. Hopefully, the government will work things out and we can all get back to work. It might have been a rational hope at the time, but reading this 200 years later, we can only see it as naive. Back to the present, we have to finish helping Paladin Dance get the deep range transmitter. And so we go through the door to the engine core room. Watch your footing. Looks like the power's out in this section. Look at this place. Scribes would have a field day in here. We see the XMB booster rocket hanging from the ceiling in the middle of this huge blast chamber. It is a gorgeous sight to behold, and it looks very familiar, almost like the rockets that were attached to the USS Constitution, only this one is clearly much bigger. They're clearly not the same rocket. The rockets that were on the Constitution were NX-42 rockets, as Ironsides himself tells us. Our twin NX-42 rockets will alight and then moor us from this dreaded savings and loan. We also find another rocket like this, but also considerably smaller than the XMB booster that we find here in Arcjet. If you head over to the Mass Blood Clinic near Fort Hagen, just east, we find a rocket on a flatbed truck. It's connected to a terminal, and the terminal says that this is a thermal engine prototype G10. The terminal also says Arcjet Systems. What is this doing out here? Why did Arcjet Systems put this non-XMB rocket, this G-10 rocket, on a flatbed truck and send it out to the Commonwealth? Well, maybe this was part of the public relations press tour that the USSA wanted them to take part of. Maybe they were trying to boost patriotism and morale within the American people by parading this marvel of human engineering around the nation. Whatever the reason, this terminal still functions and we can use it to begin a test fire. But we get a warning saying that a breach is detected in the propellant injection system. Catastrophic failure is likely. We have to clear the area, but if we're not fast enough... <laughs> But I want to see what this explosion looks like, so we're going to try again, and getting far enough back... What a boom! Very similar to the catastrophic failure we see on the USS Constitution when the turbo pump bearings are doused with hydrochloric acid. But back at Arcjet, we have the mother of all engines suspended in the air before us. The transmitter should be in the control room at the top of the core, but it looks like the elevators are dead. We'll have to keep heading down for now find a way to get the facility's power back online. There has to be a power backup system somewhere. Scout the maintenance area off of the main chamber. I'll remain here and watch our backs. Now the elevator on this level does not have any power and the only way to get the deep range transmitter is to take the elevator up to the control room. And so Dance has us scout the maintenance area to find a way to get the power back online. Going through a set of doors, we can round the bend to enter a workshop of sorts. Here on the table is none other but the junk jet. Fans of Fallout 3 will have fond memories of fiddling around with the junk jet in that game. On a table next to it is a holotape from the creator of this marvelous invention. Jeering, leering, laughing, mocking, taunting. 
Oh, he graduated all right from high school. It's fine, I'm sure he took shop class. Oh look, he's reading the science mags, how cute. Ha ha ha. Shop class, let's see them make this in shop class. My marvel of engineering, the finest in weaponized refuse acceleration. My beauty, my junk jet. They'll see the engineers with their suits and fancy degrees. Come Monday morning, they'll all see. Sounds like someone is bitter. This junk jet is an interesting heavy weapon. It looks like it's been made of spare parts and junk and pipes. It's got an amazing look to it. The way it works is when you reload the thing, a transfer dialog box pops up and you're instructed to transfer junk from your inventory into the junk jet. Now any kind of junk item you use is gonna have the same damage. So you could fill the thing up with pre-war money and it's gonna have the same impact as if you filled the thing up with surgical trays. In this example, I'm filling it up with synth components and pre-war money and it fires each one, one at a time. Like a Gauss rifle, it has a charge up sequence. You hold the button and then release to fire the round. Or you can tap your left mouse button to shoot them as soon as possible. This likely reduces the damage that they do. Interestingly, as I fired upon this window, some of my ammunition landed on my side. I was able to loot it back up, but to loot the rest of the junk, I had to go around to the other side of the window because somehow it had gotten through. In a way, we are being distracted by this fun gun. Back into the workshop area, we can go through a door, loot a fusion core from a fusion generator, unlock a novice locked toolbox, and then access the facilities terminal, which is locked with the novice lock. Here we learn that the engine core is operating on emergency power. The only way we can get the elevator back up and working is to start the auxiliary generators. But we hear sounds of battle and looking out the window, we see that Dance is being attacked by a whole bunch of synths. But what is this? The engine start button is directly beneath this window. You know how I am with big red buttons. I just can't resist. Down. Five, four, three, two, one. Engine firing. and nuclear fire barrels out the end of this XMB rocket. The synths are immediately eradicated, and poor Paladin Dance crouches in the corner as his power armor turns red hot. Oh my god! Are you alright? Got cooked by those flames, but thanks to my power armor, I'm still in one piece. The important thing is that we're still alive. We have a way to get to the transmitter. Let's go. But he is none the worse for wear. So we can now take the elevator, which is now fully powered up, upstairs to the control room. Up the elevator, we climb up the catwalk to the control room, only to find it infested with more synths. <laughs> Fan out and check the synth remains. They may have been after the transmitter as well. If the transmitter is on one of the synths, then that means that they're here for the same reasons that we are. Sifting through the bodies, we do indeed find the deep range transmitter on one of the destroyed synths. And like we learned in the terminal, it's pretty small. It's a nice portable size, thanks to the ingenuity of the unnamed scientist. Let's get out of here. We'll take the service elevator to the surface. Taking the service elevator to the top, we step out into fresh air. And Dance has a proposal for us. Well, that could have gone smoother, but mission accomplished. I suppose that's it then? Not necessarily. That being said, I believe we have two important matters to discuss. First and foremost, if you'll hand me the deep range transmitter, I'd like to compensate you for your assistance during this operation. I think you'll find this weapon useful. It's my own personal modification of the standard Brotherhood laser rifle. May it serve you well in battle. Don't you need to keep it? This isn't the only weapon at my disposal. Brotherhood soldiers always carry a backup. Now, as far as the second matter goes, 
I wanted to make you a proposal. We had a lot thrown at us back there. Our op could have ended in disaster, but you kept your cool and handled it like a soldier. There's no doubt in my mind that you've got what it takes. The way I see it, you've got a choice. You could spend the rest of your life wandering from place to place, trading an extra hand for a meager reward. Or, you could join the Brotherhood of Steel and make your mark on the world. So, what do you say? So, what would be expected of me if I joined? You'd be under my command, and I'd expect you to follow orders. No more mercenary work. This is the real thing. You'd have access to advanced military weapons, as well as your own personal suit of power armor. Most importantly, you'd have the Brotherhood at your back, ready to spill its own blood to keep you alive. Offer still stands. Can we count on you? Now giving me his rifle was a sweet gesture and I was happy to help, but this is my railroad character. And this character is not going to side with the Brotherhood of Steel. So you can agree to join the Brotherhood at this point, but in my case, I said no. No. I need to move on. That's a shame. Well, if you change your mind, you know where to find us. Good luck to you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full story of the Arc Jet Company in Fallout 4 and the XMB booster rocket that at one time was going to send man to Mars. It is truly amazing what man can do when government and politics are not in the way. What are your thoughts on the Arc Jet Company, ladies and gentlemen? They're not nearly as evil as vault Tech, but they do have a certain amount of corruption. Do you sympathize with Reinhardt? Would you have kept the incineration of that journalist private like he did, or would you have confessed it to the media? Was McClellan justified in taking personal credit for reducing the weight of the fuel on the XMB rocket? After all, it was his team that came up with the solution, or should he have given credit where credit was due. And what were the synths doing there? Why did they need a deep range transmitter? They can already teleport anywhere they want in the Commonwealth. Whom do they need to contact with this transmitter? Does this tell us that there may be Institute Labs elsewhere in the world? Possibly in the Capital Wastelands? Or maybe in some other unnamed location that might be the setting for a future Fallout game? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. I read all of your comments and I use your comments as inspiration for my future videos. I publish a new video six days a week. Sometimes it's Fallout 4, sometimes it's Fallout New Vegas. Soon I will be embarking on Fallout 3. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss an Oxhorn video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. And if you're interested in an Oxhorn or a Fallout themed t-shirt, check out my shirt shop. I'll be coming out with some new designs soon. I've got a link to my shop in the description of this video. And if you like what I do and you'd like to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers can access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.